Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari confirms that he's seeking another term in elections next year, ending months of speculation about his future after bouts of ill health. Also, I'm joined by Dr. Edna Adan Ishmael. The former foreign minister for the autonomous region of Somaliland was also Somalia's first nurse midwife who went on to found a renowned maternity hospital, spearhead campaigns for education and against female genital mutilation and oversee peace talk efforts between Somalia and her homeland. And we head to the Sahara to take a closer look at a hotly contested race. Over a thousand people from 49 countries take part in Morocco's 33rd Sand Marathon. But first, Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari has confirmed that he will be running again in next year's elections. The 75 year old's hoping to get the backing of the ruling APC party to seek another term. Buhari came to power in 2015, vowing to crack down on Boko Haram insurgents. Now, that campaign has met with some success, but the militants do remain a threat in the northeast of the country. During his time in office, the country also fell into recession, and last year there were concerns about Buhari's fitness for office after he spent months out of the country being treated in London. Our correspondent Sam Olokoya joins us now with more. Sam, is it a surprise that he's announced his desire to run again, considering just how much of the year he spent out of the country last year? I mean, he, he was away for so many months. Uh, people were concerned about his age. People were concerned about his ability to continue in office. Indeed, before he was even voted into office at the age of uh, 72 or thereabouts, he himself said he's not sure he will go for a second term. So a number of Nigerians were hoping that, uh, he, given his experience of not being able to be in office for several months, taking treatment abroad, he might uh, decide to take a rest. But now he's uh, indicated that he's going to run uh, for a second term. So what do you think his chances are? What's your sense of where Buhari stands in overall public opinion at the moment? Uh, within minutes after he declared his interest, to seek re-election. The stock uh, market uh, dropped by a, a three months uh, low. I mean, that's an indication that it's not altogether popular. And also, he, he's lost a lot uh, in the south, down part of the country. Many in the south believe he's uh, served the interests of the north. Many believe he's a, a bit sectional. So he has really, really lost a lot of goodwill, the level of goodwill he had before the before he was voted in, he's really, really lost that. But whether he will win the election is another thing entirely. I think it's one thing for a president not to be popular. It's another thing to have a strong person to defeat him. As we speak today, I don't think of any party that is strong enough to defeat his party. And I don't think I can't think of any candidate that might be strong enough to, to defeat him. We don't know. I mean, we still have a little less than a year to go. So may, maybe uh, something could happen. There could be changes. We don't know. But as of today, I think he, he seems uh, to have a very good chance of winning. Thanks very much. Sam Olakoya there for us in Lagos. Look now at some other news. On Monday, Uganda's Constitutional Court began hearing a case against a law that removed a 75-year-old age limit to the presidency. Opposition politicians and the Bar Association are challenging the legislation which was passed in December. It was widely seen as a move to allow current leader, 73-year-old Yauri Museveni, to run again when his term expires in 2021. He's been in office since 1986. And in DR Congo, six people have been killed in an attack in Virunga National Park. Five of the victims are park rangers. The sixth is reportedly a driver. Virunga is home to critically endangered mountain gorillas. There's not been any immediate claim of responsibility yet, but authorities have blamed militia groups operating in the area. They've been accused of controlling the poaching industry and deforestation to support the rebellions. Well, with me next is Dr. Edna Adan Ishmael. She's a former foreign minister for the semi-autonomous region of Somaliland, a former Somali first lady and a renowned activist working to improve healthcare 
and education in her homeland. She has a particular focus on stopping female genital mutilation. Trained in the UK, she became Somalia's first qualified nurse midwife and in 2002 founded her own maternity hospital in Somaliland. Now, it sought independent recognition as a separate state from Somalia since 1991. That's not yet happened, but in practice, it does operate autonomously from Somalia and is in many ways far more functional as a country. Uh, Dr. Ishmael, thanks so much for coming in to see us. It's a pleasure. Um, first of all, do you think that Somaliland is any closer to being recognised than when you were foreign, foreign minister in uh, the mid-2000s? Yes, of course. Um, every day brings improvements in Somaliland. It brings development. It brings investments. It brings the return of its people from the diaspora to set up businesses and bring their families home. And every day uh, it proves to the world that Somaliland is a functioning country, a country that deserves recognition for all the achievements it has been able to bring uh, during the time that it has separated from Somalia uh, 28 years ago. Talking about investment, uh, Somaliland's increasingly aligning itself with Dubai. Um, it's uh, agreed a deal to build a naval base in Berbera and run a, a port uh, for DP, DP World, which I believe is owned majority owned by the government of uh, UAE. Um, deals like this must cause tension with Somalia. Of is course. it worth the stress? Well, Somaliland has been going alone uh, since it separated from Somalia. And of course, anything that brings improvement and democracy and, and uh, development and economic growth in Somaliland is not going to please some neighboring Somalia, which has done everything in its power during the war to bomb and, and uh, kill civilians in Somaliland. And since we separated from Somalia, some, uh, it has continued to deny Somaliland its um, right to its own self-determination to do business where it wishes to do business, when Somalia itself has not been able to run its own country and um, bring about any, sense, any peace in Somalia. By contrast, Somaliland has been doing business with many nations. The port of Berbera is one of the oldest ports uh, at the mouth of the Red Sea uh, for centuries, and it has been the uh, lifeline for Somaliland for the past 29 years. Um, of course, doing business uh, because Somaliland is at the, you know, at the mouth of the Red Sea, mm -hmm. it has a great country, Ethiopia, which is landlocked as a neighbor, which relies on imports either from Djibouti or Somaliland uh, and the ports uh, in the Horn of Africa, Somaliland has that potential to be an economic uh, country that, that is... Regardless of objections from Mogadishu, they, they don't appear Mog to be going very far. Mogadishu will continue to object anything that is good and, and democratic in neighbouring Somalia, Somaliland. Well, you were also... Um named special representative for peace talks between the two governments, between uh, Somalia and Somaliland. Yes. Both countries have uh, uh, recently, relatively recently, got, got new leaders. Has that changed anything in terms of the dynamics of the peace talks? It has not, because um, Somalia continues to maintain its stand that it owns Somaliland, when in fact it does not. I mean, Somaliland was former British Somaliland protectorate, where Somalia has been the, form, the, the former Italian Somalia. Uh, that, that's two why independent it's countries. It's, it's two independent countries. Somaliland is the one that was independent first. In fact, when Somaliland was independent from Britain, Somalia was still an Italian colony. So there is, it's not one country that owns the other. There were two sovereign Somali nations that decided to unite. Many countries un decide to unite. Many companies decide to unite. It was a voluntary union. It was not a conquest, conquest of one country over the other. But that union didn't work. And when Somaliland tried to withdraw from that hasty, failed union, uh, Somalia took objection to it and place itself in a position of ownership over Somaliland, which it does not have. So you've invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, yes. uh, a lot of encouragement and campaigning yes. Yes. in trying to build um, 
better healthcare Absolutely. in communities, better education. Yes. Have you seen over your career much of a success in uh, oh, yielding from your efforts? Oh, yes. Somaliland today has, has universities, has schools, has hospitals. Uh, Somaliland in 1991, when the, the troops of uh, Somalia were ousted, was a country that was left for dead. It was flattened out, no functioning hospitals, no functioning schools. Uh, today, Somaliland has more children going to school than have ever in the history of my country. Somaliland has, uh, uh, in fact, my, my little hospital, which is a, a, a referral hospital where many complicated cases are brought to, has managed to lower the, the maternal mortality rate of Somaliland to less than a quarter of the national average. Uh, it's something to be proud of. Women have the vote. Women have positions. I have women surgeons in my hospital who are able to operate and save lives. Dr. Ishmael? Thank you very much for coming in to speak to us. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. It's a pleasure. For the Thank moment. You. Well, finally, we head to Morocco, where the 33rd edition of the Race of the Sands was held this year. Our reporters headed out to join the athletes in the hotly contested race. Take a look. Last training session before kickoff. Morocco's Marathon des Sables race is longer than five whole marathons. It's run under the burning sun and over scorching sand. A dream for some. It was Magali's dream first and then it became mine too. I was undergoing chemotherapy treatment at the time and we used to run together. Magali suggested we enlist together with Tiffany and we're all here today. When she was fighting cancer, Cynthia drew much of her strength from sport. But running is just one part of the challenge here in the Sahara Desert. Athletes have to fight the elements too without getting any assistance. They have to carry everything they need for the race, including food, and this can weigh no more than 10 kilograms. Efficiency is key. We found a system. We got lyophilized food, prepared it and compressed it into our backpacks and labeled it in bags with stickers, indicating how much water we needed to add. Planning time is far behind. Everyone is set to go and to let go of the stress. Some will try to break personal records, others hope to make it to the finish line. They have their maps and a number of stops on the way to get water and to treat their wounds. Temperatures hit 50 degrees Celsius around here and that's tough on runners' feet. Six hours later, Cynthia, Magali and Tiffany cross the finish line. We made it. Phase one is over. <laughs> Time to rest and check our feet. They need all the rest they can get. They've got five more phases to go. Thanks for joining us. Take care.